everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. In today's video, we're going to take a look at the 10 most powerful nations in the Wheel of Time books. Before getting into the list, let me say guys, the past few weeks have broken records with views in a week. The channel is growing at like a crazy rate and I want to thank all of you for your support and the kind words in the comments. I'd also like to thank the folks over at audible.com for their support of the channel as well. They have partnered with the channel and are offering a very special gift to my viewers. If you have not yet taken advantage of the free audiobook offer, what are you waiting for? Like seriously. All you have to do is go to www.audibletrial.com forward slash nadeless and sign up for a one month free trial. They give you your choice of one of thousands of audiobook titles for free. You can then decide if you want to keep the service or not, and you can cancel it at any time and keep the book that you got for free. It's that simple. If you've never listened to The Wheel of Time on audiobook, I can't recommend it enough. It's a totally different experience, and if you think that you're due for like a reread, this is the way to do it. Seriously, just by doing the trial as well, you're really helping out the channel. So getting into my list, let's throw up a spoiler warning. This video will carry a spoiler rating of red, meaning it will have major spoilers for the series all the way through A Memory of Light. If you don't want the book spoiled, please watch at your own risk, you have been warned. So in figuring out the most powerful nations in the Wheel of Time, just like many of my other top 10 videos, I came up with a ranking system to help me formulate my thoughts. Obviously this is not an exact science, so before you kill me in the comments saying that's not exact, I know it. And I'm basing most of my rankings on bits and pieces that we get from the novels, things that Jordan said in interviews, and the Wheel of Time companion books. You will very likely disagree with me, and that's totally fine. I love the discussion. Let me know in the comments how I'm wrong in a polite way. Now I'll start off by saying I don't want this to just be about who would win in a straight up war, but more about their overall power. Obviously military power rates very highly here, but it is not the only factor. I used four total criteria for my rankings. Economy, the economic power that the country has. Military power, so their military might and, and total military forces. Influence, so this would be soft power, alliances, the ability to have political influences. And then lastly, technology. So this could be military tech or channelers. Anything that really gives them an advantage that's an object. I weighted each of these differently as some are more important than others. Economy is gonna be ranked on a scale of one to 10. Military power will get the highest weight and gets a score out of 25. Influence gets a score out of 10 and technology gets a score out of five. That gives us a total score of 50. So that's enough setup, let's get into the list. Coming in at number 10, Shinar. Shinar is a nation in the borderlands that sits on the far northeastern part of the Westlands. Shinar is a monarchy and very much a warrior culture due to the constant battle with the shadow. So let's rank Shinar. For economy, Shinar is the weakest borderland nation in regards to economy, and the borderlands are already somewhat behind the rest of the world in that regard. Shinar gets a 4 out of 10 for economy. For military power, Shinar has a very strong and well-trained military force. They are considered to be the best heavy cavalry in the world, and their warriors are known as lancers due to the lances that they carry. Their military force is not extremely large, numbering somewhere between 50,000 and 75,000 soldiers at full strength, but they are all well-trained and battle-tested. Shinar gets a 17 out of 25 for military. For influence, Shinar really only has relations with the other borderland nations in Tar Valen. It is not a center of trade, and it does not carry a lot of sway with other nations within the Westlands. It does have some influence in the other borderland nations, however. Because of this, Shinar gets a 4 out of 10 for influence. Lastly, for technology. Shinar doesn't have any massively unique technology that sets them apart from other nations, but they are extremely accomplished at using the lance, and they have adapted well for battle and are very well supplied for it. They have been fighting the shadow, and they really use their technology to basically the best that they can. They get a 3 out of 5 for technology. So in total, Shinar gets a 29 out of 50 and earns the number 10 spot on my list. Number 9, Ilion. Ilion is a prosperous nation situated in the very south central part of the Westlands. It is a nation that has a strong economy and a strong military and is one of the major powers in the Westlands. And they talk like pirates. But I don't like to be pushing athwart my betters, but I'll say this, sir. I know every seaman in these here parts like the palm of his ass. In terms of its economy, Ilion is quite strong here. It is one of the main economic powers of the Westlands and coming in just behind a few other nations. They get trade with Shara and the Sea Folk and have a large trading fleet that trades inland as well. Ilion gets a 7 out of 10 for economy. For their military, Ilion is decently strong again. They can field a fairly large army, near 90,000 men, 
and they have a small elite force called the Companions, which serve like their special forces. They have seen some battle with Tyr and against the White Cloaks in the past. They get a 14 out of 25 for military power, primarily just because they're not considered a major military power, but they are formidable, just not as elite as some of the others on this list. For influence, Ilian is one of the major powers in the Westlands, having some influence on nations that surround it. Politically, Ilian is a stable country, and it controls all of the land within its borders. Because of this, and the weak nations to the north and to the west of it, it's quite influential. Ilian gets a 7 out of 10 for influence. For technology, there's really nothing that sets them apart. They do not have channelers in their army, and they have no special military technology. They get a 2 out of 5 for tech. In total, Ilian earns a 30 out of 50 and the number 9 spot on my list. Number 8, Tier. Tyr is a neighbor to Ilion and her greatest rival. Tyr is also to the very south part of the Westlands and is one of the major powers on the continent. Tyr is home to the Stone of Tyr and a very prosperous economy. So Tyr's economy is based on grain, olives, horses, fishing, and steel. They are one of the Westlands' most prosperous economies, second only to Andor. They have control of the mouth of the River Arannon, and that's a major trade highway that runs all the way through the Westlands, all the way up to the Borderlands. For economy, Tyr gets an 8 out of 10. For their military, Tyr also has a very strong military. They can field a large army for a single country, being able to field around 85,000 troops when fully ready. They have a mixed force of cavalry and pikemen. They are battle-tested against Kyrian and Ilian. They also have a special elite force called the Defenders of the Stone. They get a 13 out of 25 for military. As for influence, Tyr is a major economic power, and the nobility of Tyr, the High Lords, have a great deal of wealth and influence in the world. Because of their imbalanced economy, the Tyre and High Lords are, tend to be some of the wealthiest people on the continent. They are able to exert control on their neighbors, and their wealth and unique goods that they can provide give them a great deal of soft power over the rest of the world. Tyr gets an 8 out of 10 for influence. As for technology, they don't really have anything in unique in terms of technology they use. They have a bunch of items of, of the power, but they are so against channeling in Tyr that they would never use any of them. They get a 2 out of 5 for technology. In total, Tyr gets a 31 out of 50 and earns the number 8 spot on my list. Number 7. Kandor. Kandor is the second of the Borderland nations to make my list and sits in the direct north of the Westlands. It is very prosperous as Borderland countries go, with a very vibrant economy and a strong military. For economy, Kandor is known as a very strong economy due to its very powerful merchant guild. It is the most economically powerful of the Borderland nations, and because of this, it gets an 8 out of 10 for economy. For military, Kandor is equal to the other Borderland nations in regards to military strength, boasting an army of near 80,000 men, and all of them battle-tested and well-trained due to their proximity with the Blight. Kandor gets a 17 out of 25 for military power. As for influence, Kandor isn't a super influential nation within the Westlands, with most of its influence coming in the Borderlands. Kandor gets a 4 out of 10 for influence. For tech, Kandor is just like the other Borderland nations. It has the best technology to fight wars and the most developed use of that technology, although nothing really special. They get a 3 out of 5 for technology. In total, Kandor gets a 32 out of 50 and earns the number 7 spot on my list. Number 6, Saldea. At number 6, we have another Borderland nation and the last of them on my list. Saldea is the largest and most populous of the Borderland nations. For economy, Saldea has a very strong economy based around trade in furs, ice peppers, and timber. Traders from around the world will trade with Saldea for their ice peppers, which are especially popular in Tyr. For economy, Saldea is just slightly behind Kandor and earns a 7 out of 10. For military, Saldea is a very powerful and strong military, just like the other Borderland nations. Saldea does field a larger army due to its bigger population and size, and the Saldeans are known to be the best light cavalry in the world. Because of their slightly larger military, Saldea gets an 18 out of 25 for military power. For influence, Saldea is the most influential of the Borderland nations, again, as it is the largest and the most populous, and the only place to get certain trade goods in the world. It is not massively influential like some of the southern nations, but as Borderland nations go, it is the most influential. Saldea gets a 5 out of 10 for influence. And lastly for tech, just like the other Borderland nations, Saldea uses the best technology available for warfare, and they use it very efficiently and effectively. They have been at war with the Shadow constantly for thousands of years. They get a 3 out of 5 for technology. In total, Saldea gets a 33 out of 50 and earns the number 6 spot on my list. Number 5. Tarvalon. Tarvalon is the home of the Aes Sedai and is the largest city in the Westlands. The island and surrounding country is controlled by the Aes Sedai. You can see my video about the subject if you want a more of a deep dive into Tarvalon. For economy, 
Tarvalon is one of the wealthiest nations in the Westlands, despite its small size and home to the wealthiest institution in the land. The White Tower collects tribute from other nations, as well as controlling the trade on the River Arannon and being the home to the largest banks in the Westlands. For economy, Tarvalon gets a 9 out of 10. As for the military, despite being such a small nation, Tarvalon can summon quite a large military force when needed. Tower Guard is a very elite fighting force that is trained in multiple different types of fighting, and stands tens of thousands strong. Combine this with the power of the Aes Sedai and their channeling, as well as their warders, Tarvalon has a good amount of military power for its small size. Tarvalon gets a 10 out of 25 for military, lower only because of their low manpower reserves. For influence, Tarvalon is easily the most influential nation or culture within the Westlands. They assert control over almost every nation in terms of political pressure, even in countries where they are not respected or Aes Sedai are even outlawed. They negotiate treaties, instigate wars, and advise monarchs. Tarvalon gets a 10 out of 10 for influence. Lastly, for tech, Tarvalon has the power of the Aes Sedai and their channeling abilities, as well as all of the objects of power stored within the White Tower. Add to that the state-of-the-art weaponry that they have, Tarvalon gets a 5 out of 5 for technology. In total, Tarvalon gets a 34 out of 50 and gets the number 5 spot on my list. Number 4. Shara. Shara is a very mysterious land to the far east of the continent that the Westland sits upon. Very little is known about these people until the final book of the series. If you want to know more about Shara, please take a look at my cultural profile video on Shara. So in terms of its economy, Shara is one of the few places in the world that produces silk. Because of this, it has a valuable commodity that is traded at its ports, but most other interactions are prevented. Shara's economy and trade is mostly internal. While it is clearly a powerful economy, the lack of diversity drives the score down a little bit. Shara gets a 7 out of 10 for economy. In terms of military, Shara has a very strong military supported by large numbers and the use of channelers for combat. The military forces of the Sharans do not seem to be super well trained in the story and they're not great fighters, but rather they're huge numbers and the military being propped up by the power of the channelers. It is for this reason alone that they don't get a perfect score here, just because they're not super well trained. Shara gets a 22 out of 25 for military forces. For influence, Shara is isolationist and prevents any contact with outsiders. Because of this, there are no treaties, no alliances, and no soft influence on other nations. They get a 1 out of 5 for influence, only because they control the silk trade. For technology, they use channelers to a great extent and have massive numbers of them. For this reason, they get a 5 out of 5 for technology. In total, Shara gets a 35 out of 50 and gets the number 4 spot on my list. Number 3. Andor. Andor is the most powerful of the Westland nations. It's the most populous, the wealthiest, and the most influential place outside of Tarvalon. Make sure you check out my video doing a deep dive into Andor's culture. It was one of the very first videos I made. You can find that in my cultural profile playlist. In terms of economy, Andor has the strongest economy in the Westlands. It sits in the middle of the continent and it controls trade routes throughout it. Also, it has large deposits of timber, ores, a great horse trade, as well as being a farming center for the continent. For economy, Andor gets a 9 out of 10. For military forces, Andor has one of the strongest militaries of all the Westland countries. It has a huge population which allows it to feed an army of over 200,000 men if the queen called all of her troops in. Andor also uses some very special technology in the dragons, and they have use of the kin, a set of channelers that are basically in the service of the crown. The only thing that hurts Andor a bit here is the fact that their military is not a full-time military, and they are not as battle-tested as some of the other military forces on this list. Andor gets a 19 out of 25. For influence, Andor is the most influential nation outside of Tarvalon within the Westlands. Their economy, geography, and strong tradition of power establishes them as the most powerful kingdom in the Westlands. Andor gets an 8 out of 10 for influence. As for technology, Andor has quite a bit here. They have the kin, and basically they're used as a traveling service with the one power. They are also the only nation with the secret to dragons and their construction and operation. They have a very well-equipped military with vast resources. They get a 5 out of 5 for technology. In total, Andor gets a 41 out of 50 and earns the number 3 spot on my list. Number 2. The Aiel. The Aiel are not technically one people, but at the end of the novel, they really operate as one and they work together. They are a strong, very powerful, and disciplined people that were forged in the threefold land. They are known to be strong warriors, but they have expanded their power beyond just the military. For economy, the Aiel previously relied on trade across the waste in silk. They were the conduit for much of the silk that came into the Westlands as it had to come through the waste 
or via ship. They also traded a great deal with other nations through peddlers. The Aiel generated a good amount of money from raids upon other nations and each other. For economy, the Aiel get a 7 out of 10. For military, the Aiel are the most deadly fighters in the world. They are the best trained, the most durable, the most skilled, and the most coordinated. It is said that one Aiel soldier is as good as 10 wetland soldiers, which is something that we actually see in the novels fleshed out a few times. Everyone within their society can fight, and because of this, they are very deadly. They get a 25 out of 25 for military power. For influence, the Aiel have gained quite a bit of power here. They were once fairly isolationist, only controlling trade through the waste and seeking to separate themselves from the rest of the world. They are now the primary police force and judges for the Dragon's Peace and have sway over all of the kingdoms of the Westlands including the Shanchan. Because of this, their influence as a people has risen greatly. They get an 8 out of 10 for influence. For tech, the Aiha have access to weaponry that they are highly trained in, as well as the use of wise ones that can channel. While they are not known for their technology, the ability of hundreds of wise ones to channel gives them a high score. They get a 4 out of 5 for technology. In total, the Aiyo get a 44 out of 50 and are in the number 2 spot on my list. Number 1. The Shan Chan. The Shan Chan are the nation that was forged when Ardor Hawkwing sent an army to conquer the other side of the world about a thousand years prior to the story. They returned during the novels to reconquer Hawkwing's lost empire. For economy, the Shan Chan control vast amounts of land within the Westlands more than any other nation. They control all of the natural resources from these lands as well as trade. The stability they provide has caused the economies in these areas to flourish as well. They have an entire continent they control once they reestablish the rule of the Empress over in Shan Chan. Because of this, they get a 10 out of 10 for economy. For military, the Shan Chan have the most powerful military in the world, only really rivaled by the IU. They have a very well-disciplined, well-trained, and well-commanded army with special forces and creatures and beasts that serve to amplify their power. They also have Damani, or leashed channelers, that give them the use of the one power as a weapon in battle. They are very fearsome. The Shan Chan get a 25 out of 25 for military forces. In terms of influence, the Shan Chan are not exactly on great terms with the rest of the countries of the world. In fact, there's almost open hostility, but they do control great areas of land, they have a prosperous economy, and their way of life is going to spread. They get a 7 out of 10 for influence. In terms of technology, they are really unmatched here. With Rakan, Torm, and all of the other animals that they have under their control, as well as Damani and their well-equipped military, they are really at the top when it comes to technology. They get a 5 out of 5 for tech. In total, that gives the Shan Chan a 47 out of 50 and the top spot on my list. So that's my list of the 10 most powerful countries in the world of the Wheel of Time. What do you think of my list? Did I get it right? What did I get wrong? Let me know in the comments below. Hey, and if you're liking the content, please take a minute and hit the like button and also make sure to hit the subscribe and click the bell icon right next to it so you can be updated when I release new content. Make sure to also check out my Patreon page to see more of the behind the scenes stuff that I do as well as get access to my public Discord server where I talk about the series. I will be doing a Patreon only live chat video where we'll be all I'll be able to interact and that'll be coming up shortly so if you want to be a part of that make sure to check out the patreon thanks everyone who's supporting me over there you guys are really very much appreciated hey guys until next time peace out tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a rope of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? Tinker asked the mistress, don't you got a labour man? Yes, but she replied, he lacks your talent and your hands And I can tell you got the skill to hit the spots you see So Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? Tinker said the neighbour boy could probably get it done He's far too inexperienced, I'll never go that young I'm sure he can be broken in or top, but he's too sweet So Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? The mistress asked the Tinker, can you help me move the chairs? They're just a bit too heavy and they need to go upstairs she bats her eyes, the tinker sighs, then picks them up with ease. So, tinker, manly tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?